Of course I want to live to be 200, Dad. Who doesn't? <laughs> That's my daughter, Amalia. She's 10, and she's not on the fence on this one. I want to get to 500 at least. Uh, okay. Do you think you might get bored of doing the same thing over and over again, maybe? No, Dad. I wouldn't do the same thing over and over again. What would you do then, sweetheart? I would do everything I wanted to do on Earth. Quantum biology, teaching, playing football, running an aquarium. What about acting? Totally. Okay. And lots of holidays. Wait, oh wait. Ethiopia, Senegal, Svalbard, Madagascar, lemurs. I would also study lemurs for at least 50 years. Okay, that's, that's the first 200 years gone. And then okay. what happens with the rest of... Well, then there's space. Do you know how long it's going to take to get to Alpha Centauri, our nearest galactic neighbor? Don't know. Can we do that? A hundred years there, a hundred years back. So you see, 500 years is nothing, Dad. 500 years is nothing, kids. Uh, but maybe that's the big question. Once we've answered how we can scientifically and financially live for so long, what are we going to do with all that time? I mean, what if as a species we get so bored that we choose not to live so long, even though we can? My name is Sam Guenya, and this is The 200-Year-Old. Scientists predict that the first person to live to 200 may have already been born. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. As Sunlam turns 100 this year, they're looking ahead at what fundamental changes might take place in the world so that we can plan better for the future. So how does society have to change if we all live for much longer? This is Professor Sarah Harper, Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford and the founder of the Oxford Institute of Population Aging, speaking in 2018. The really important question then is, is this increased life expectancy at the population level? Is it going to be healthy or is it going to be frail and disabled? If it's going to be healthy, then one could possibly argue that the societal implications will be much reduced. We'll be working well into our 70s and 80s because we won't hit frailty probably till we get nearer to a century. That, however, will lead to questions around generational succession in so much as it will take increasingly wider gaps between the generations, leading to the fact that we may well be into our 80s before we start inheriting money from parents or even grandparents, Uh, in our 60s and 70s before we reach the top of our careers. The exciting thing about ageing and increasing life expectancy is that actually there's nothing new about living longer. Um, The first a uh, verified supercentenarian, that's somebody who made it to 110, was actually born in 1798. Uh, he lived in the lowlands uh, and he um, made it to 110 and died just before the beginning of the 20th century. And in fact, he held the male record for longevity till 1966. We've always, always had long-lived populations. Um, There is nothing unusual about making it into your 80s or even 90s. What we're seeing is that the mass population is beginning to achieve that. So I think psychologically, um, it's more that uh, we had this strange bleep uh, which occurred at the end of the 20th century in some high-income countries where we introduced this notion of early retirement and we took perfectly fit, healthy, able Uh, particularly men in their 50s, and we cast them out of the labour market, and then we gave them 40 years of doing nothing. And I think that time has gone. We can't afford it financially. Come on. You have to have known that I would go and see Lissetti once I found out where she was. So I'm taking a long shot and travelling across South Africa to Mtata, where Ukoko Lissedi was born 199 years, 364 days ago. I'm hoping to find her in the flesh. And I've got to say, I have more questions than answers. Maybe I'm selfishly dead set on having a conversation with her in real life because of the decision I have on my hands about my own longevity, but it's more than that. I need at least one of my conversations with her to have no technology to hide behind. I want her to get really, really real with me. 
I also can't help but wonder why all the secrecy. Although her upcoming birthday is a big deal and maybe she just doesn't want to be bombarded by the media and I guess essentially to her, I suppose I'm, I'm a journalist. These last few weeks, I've had a small glimpse into why she finds the public eye so uncomfortable. It hasn't taken the press long to track me down as one of her direct relatives. In her absence, all her descendants have been bombarded with requests to talk about her. Sam, there are 2,453 new articles with high credibility rankings on the 200-year-old. Of these, 898 mention you. I am picking up inaccuracies. Would you like me to contact the authors and make corrections this morning? So ironically at this point, I've taken some inspiration from Lisedi and gone off the grid and ignored all attempts to contact me. And please decline all contacts and don't share my location. Gotcha. Chat later. Of course, I'm starting to understand why everyone is so interested. I mean, they have a lot of the same questions that I have. There's a deep communal sense of uneasiness at the barriers we're crossing. Will she be furious at me for coming to find her against her wishes? Hell hath no fury as a 200-year-old woman scorned. What phase of life will I find her in? What is she hiding? And most importantly, what on earth do you give a 200-year-old for a birthday? Hmm? I'm standing next to Lucetti. You hearing the gentle hum of the machine that's aiding her breathing? She's asleep. This is not the same person I've been talking to over the last few days. I see a woman in extreme old age on the bed in front of me. She's incredibly frail. It doesn't feel too different from the virtual hospital space we've previously spoken in. The difference is the crowds of people. I haven't seen a single other patient here. We've gone and made sickness itself obsolete. Hi, I'm Dr. May. Mrs. Ndaba stopped taking anti-aging therapies quite some time ago. She's been experiencing natural old age for years, but I'm afraid it's days now, possibly even hours. Thank you, Doctor. She's close to death, and being confined to her bed, she has obviously been spending her few waking hours in virtual memories, many of them talking to me and spending time with loved ones like Burn. She's no longer capable of talking in real life. So all I can do is sit by her bed, hold her hand and wait for her to invite me into a memory so we can have what I'm sad to consider will likely be our final conversation. I can see now why she didn't want me to see her like this. We're no longer accustomed to witnessing extreme old age. We've been spoiled with excessive youth. We intend to go. I thought I told you I do not want you to come. I am sorry, Coco. I just didn't understand, okay? I I needed to see you. I wanted to talk to you in person. In person, you don't like... What does that mean anymore? It's okay, Sam. It's okay, Mdana. I'm a grumpy old woman these days. Perhaps, perhaps this is the only way you can see the full story. We're back in Coco Lissetti's favorite virtual space, where we started these conversations. We're in her kitchen. She's stirring her tea. She looks exactly as she always has in these conversations. Alert, very much alive. But the illusion of reality we've put together so well is starting to unravel for me. I can feel the pull of the hospital room and I can hear the artificial breath going into her body. I ask for her forgiveness for disobeying her wishes and ask if she spends a lot of time here when she's not talking to me. There comes a point where the mind just cannot handle any more change. When I decided to stop taking longevity treatments, I started to spend more and more time in memory spaces that were familiar from the past. I guess you could say I don't even experience the present anymore. But I am happy, Sam. I have many lovely paths to wander around and spend time in. So you decided a long time ago that you did not want to live this long? 
I decided to hand the decision back to nature. My Oh man, I sound like burn. <laughs> I didn't expect to make it to 200, but here I am. I guess it has to be me after all. The doctors say I might last a few more days, maybe even till my birthday. That lady in Malaysia must be very cross with me right now. <laughs> but who knows, perhaps she'll be the first to make it to 300. Then she can win this silly game. So, we'd better finish up, Sam. Then I can't be bothered with all the media nonsense. I'm only talking to you. So, whatever we talk about is going to be what the world has of my story. So, you'd better make your last questions good ones, huh? No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. But let's talk somewhere else. I've been by myself all day and I need to be around people. Right, so uh, this is Joburg then? Yep. The old Johannesburg of my youth. Ah. Back in the 2020s. If I need a bit of life, this is where I come. It's a great city, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Lissetti always seems to sense what question I'm going to ask her. In our final conversation, I want to understand the bigger picture. What does breaking the 200 barrier mean for our society? What have we had to change? What do we still need to change? So, you want to know how much has changed in society? Hmm. You know, Sam, I'll tell you this. It has both changed surprisingly little and absolutely completely. I, okay. <laughs> I, all right. All right, all right. People haven't changed all that much. It's very easy to confuse how things look in all of this new technology. You know, we make these beautiful virtual spaces. We can create any location from our past perfectly. But what do we do? Mm. We sit and have coffee together. We know it's not real coffee, but <laughs> if you want to sit and chat and share stories, yeah. that's exactly what you do. But what I've learned is that the way people are is not so different throughout the ages. Shall we get a coffee? Let's sit here, shall we? Yeah, sure. Two coffees, please, dear. Okay, cool. So, what's different then? What did we have to change drastically as people started to live longer? Back when it was all just an experiment, People were fearful of extended life because they had so many questions and they knew so little about how it would affect their world. At the start, people were worried about the pressure longevity put on our resources and our economy. And they were right to be concerned because as you know, there was a period of extreme pressure. Essentially, the economy broke and we had to start from scratch with new ideas. So was technology to blame for all of that? Oh, no, no. As we began to see that technology was not closing doors of opportunity, but rather opening doors of possibility. So we had to make the most of those possibilities and dump some of the baggages of the past. This is Paul Irving in 2018, chairman of the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging. I'm skeptical about the, the potential of extraordinarily strong lives, but I think that there's actually quite a good likelihood that we'll have longer lives than we have today as a result of continuing advances in science and the, the spread of, of, um, of innovations in, in, in public health. And the, um, the, the risk associated with that is, and again, it's a, it's a paradox, um, the, the, the risk is, is that with these, these additional years, we won't have productive things to do to fill them. And I think that that can create and anxieties that can create uh, uncertainties, but it also represents this fantastic possibility, the potential to be around multiple generations of one's family, the potential again to, to do uh, uh, different kinds of work at, at, different, uh, at different points in one's life to develop new relationships. 
so I think it's incumbent on on each one of us, and certainly incumbent on on the broader society, the institutions within the society, to, to, to reimagine how how we will live these these potentially longer lives, and to ensure that they are filled with as much purpose and health and productivity and engagement as as is possible. Uh, to do anything less would would I think be to to do a disservice to the accomplishments of of science over the last 150 years or so. As, as I think about this question of, of what will people do? Will, will they do conventional work? Will they do something else with their time? Will they simply learn or recreate? The, the, the one thing I think is, is the most important overarching concern is that they not withdraw and become is, isolated and lonely and, and disengaged. So, uh, whatever the solution, if the solution is a universal ba- basic income and uh, and um, and sim- simply social engagement, if the conclusion is, is that everyone should be in a, un- involved in lifelong learning and spend their time in, in, in schools as they're paid, uh, if the opportunity is shared work arrangements in which people work shorter shorter hours but in which, in which the therefore the opportunity for more people to to work is, is created then any of those and all of those are, are possibilities but i think the most important thing is that we don't retreat to our corners so the biggest change is then well universal basic income was a big one as you know it was only a few countries that introduced it at first uh, my name is David Toll. I am the president of Quantum and Forecasting. Uh, we are a uh, research and consulting agency that uses long-term strategic forecasting to help organizations thrive in future trends. Uh, so first off, um, for those who might not be familiar with the UBI, uh, it is, it's basically an uh, an an abbreviation of the universal basic income. It is a monthly stipend of money that is uh, given to every citizen without preconditions. It's free money, basically. The experiments that we've seen in countries like Canada, uh, a number of uh, Nordic countries in Europe, uh, these these smaller experiments with the UBI have shown that people who receive a UBI benefit, uh, less stress and better mental health, uh, they have food to eat and are roof to roof above their heads. They are physically healthier. They are more willing to go back to school to improve their skills, and they work harder and longer because they they are freer to find the work that's more meaningful to them. Uh, meanwhile, the neighborhoods where the UBI was tested was found to become safer. Uh, average household income actually grew, and new business startups increased significantly. And what's changed in us, you think, as a result of all these changes? You know, Sam, we used to have these old sayings, time is money. You can't put value on time. Time is precious. (laughs) (laughs) Well, something radical happened when time was suddenly no longer an issue. Mm. In just a few decades, we went from being time-starved to something entirely different. I think having more time at our disposal has made us better parents, better friends, and of course, better communities. Not perfect, perhaps, but better. Yeah. And I guess we now see things in the long term, you know, in the true sense of it. I mean, if you plant a tree now you can be around to watch it grow over the centuries. Do you think? Mm. Do you think that somehow made us more responsible, perhaps? Look, if you know you have to live for a long time with the consequences of your actions, then you tend to think a bit more, learn from your mistakes more. The thing that really defeated climate change was people realizing it wasn't just the next generation that was going to live with their mistakes. We all get to live with our mistakes now whether they are personal or global level mistakes. You know, I, I see that in raising my daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a scary thought that how I raise her may have a knock-on effect for her children and her children's children and so on and so on and so on. And I may have to be around to watch all of that and take responsibility for all of it. It makes you focus harder. 
This is a recording from an interview with Professor Jay Olshansky, a professor of public health at the University of Chicago in 2018. So we might see some, some fundamental changes to marriage, uh, to, the way, to, to jobs, to concepts of retirement, perhaps even education itself. Imagine going back to school. Like I'm, well, you know, I've been thinking of doing like going back to school in your third phase of life to relearn something totally new and different. Um, you know, once you've accumulated enough wealth that will allow you to transition over to something else, that may be a wave of the future. Now, also keep in mind, you're now going to have uh, three, four, perhaps even five generations alive at the same time. So our housing markets are likely to change. The way in which we interact with our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, those things are likely uh, to change as well. Just sort of, just the, the fabric of our society would be fundamentally altered with radical life extension. I think we can't even really comprehend exactly the way in which these, these institutions would change, uh, which is perhaps is one of the reasons why I'm reluctant to speculate on 150 and 200 year lifespans, because that is such a radical transformation from where we are today. You know, when we first started talking, you said you weren't prepared to live for so long. That's right. That perhaps it would be easier for future generations. Mm -hmm. So what is your advice for us from your personal experience, you know, of how to do things better? Oh, Sam, I've thought about this quite a lot. I do have a responsibility to the future generations, but it's not my responsibility to make their lives better or happier. No, no, they will have to do that for themselves. And I can't give them, or you, Denham, for that matter, the answers to the challenges you will face. Other than, of course, just to be kind. But the next generation's world will be so different from my time. My responsibility, actually, all of our responsibility, is to not close down options for future generations or to make things unnecessarily difficult for them. If we damage the planet so that it is uninhabitable, well, that would be robbing them of their options. That's the most important generational legacy that we can leave. I'm back at home when I get the news that I've been expecting. Sam, I've um, got some sad news for you. The medical facility just informed me of Lacedi's death and I can give you the details later. But to summarize, you could call it extreme old age. I know you'll need a few days off. I've cleared your diary and informed everyone. I'm so sorry. I know how you must feel. Coco Lisedi Ndaba died on June 14th, 2218, six days after her 200th birthday. The first human being to live for two centuries. So that was the big, full life that Coco Lissetti decided to live. All that's left now is for me to decide what I want to do with mine. And I think I want to live. Because we haven't even begun to imagine even a third of the crazy, wild, mind-blowing stuff that the human race is still going to come up with. And I want to stick around and lap it all up for as long as the world will have me. I'm Sam Gwenya, and this has been The 200-Year-Old. This podcast is brought to you by Sunlum. To subscribe, visit www.the200yearold.co.za. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. To find out more about the research that went into this episode, ask the 200-year-old a question on Twitter at 200-year-old. That's at 200-year-old. If you like this episode, please rate it and leave a review on your podcast platform.